Por favor, nos sentamos para comenzar. Good morning. Uh, I'm Jose López González uh, from Cartagena, Spain. Next, the presentation, our healthy Indara uh, Savannah Manager will begin. It will talk about Celerate Health Science, Clinical Value of Electronic Medical Records, Privacy, Security, artificial intelligence, natural language processing, machine learning, deep learning, big data in medicine, access in real time, conversion of information into knowledge, multilingual artificial intelligence of Savannah, hospitals, primary health care, management, prevention, investigation. We are privileged to have the participation of two experts of worldwide recognition in big data in medicine. It's about the Dr. Paula Sanchez Seco Toledano, Semergen New Technologies Work Group and General Practitioner in Guadalajara, Spain, and Dr. Teresa Diaz Perdigon, Savannah Site Engagement Manager. Uh, Dr. Teresa Díaz has the floor. Good morning. Um, as he said, my name is Teresa Díaz, and I'm in charge with some others in Spain of the research ecosystem at Savannah. The purpose of my presentation today is to give you an updated picture of artificial intelligence and big data in medicine. I'm going to start my presentation introducing you to Maria Vara. Maria Vara was a Spanish elderly patient who attended to the ER because of some pain on her foot, but ended up staying 22 days in the hospital. Now I'm going to tell you what really happened to Maria. When Maria attended to the ER, she was checked by the doctors, but it didn't give much importance to her pain on her foot. However, as she was a diabetic patient and had other comorbidities, they decided to leave her under observation. After a few hours under observation, Maria began worsening, beginning to show pneumonia symptoms. So she began receiving antibiotic treatment. After six days in the hospital, Maria continued worsening because she wasn't responding to the treatment and she was beginning to have tachycardia and respiratory distress. After seven days in the hospital, the doctors feared the worst 
And this was that what had started as a pneumonia had ended up evolving into septicemia. Given the severity of the patient's uh, state of health, they decided to transfer Maria to the ICU, where besides receiving the best treatments and the best cares, Maria continued worsening. First, she had a kidney failure, and then she ended up having a heart attack, which ended up with Maria's life after 22 days in the hospital. As you know, septicemia is a non-specific complication, which is very difficult to detect as at, at early stages. Maria had received the right treatments, it's just that she had received them too late. The question is, what, what would have happened if the doctors would have had access to big data and artificial intelligence? Before talking about the medicine of the future, we need to have a quick glimpse of the history of medicine. In the past, medicine used to be an intuitive medicine. It was based on the individual knowledge of a doctor. Nowadays, we know that there are more than 10,000 pathologies, and it was impossible for a doctor to retain all that information. Therefore, the diagnosis had to be done based on intuition, probability, and rules. This means that a doctor would say, this patient is too young to have a heart attack. However, this patient is too old to have bronchitis. Over the years, this intuitive medicine developed and evolved the medicine we know nowadays, which is a medicine based on clinical trials and scientific research, and is known as evidence-based medicine. In the future, although you will see during the presentation that it's starting to be the medicine of today, it will be a medicine based on precision medicine, a medicine able to merge clinical, biochemical, genetic, uh, histopathological, molecular data in order to generate algorithm, uh, predictive algorithms. It is thanks to these uh, predictive algorithms that we will have knowledge at individual level in order to improve of uh, individual level of each patient in order to improve diagnosis and treatments. Ultimately, the clinicians would have uh, the ability to quantify the individual risk of a patient to have a certain pathology and determine the best treatment for them. Just so that you know that this, uh, that this medicine that I'm talking about is part of the, the world we know right, uh, right now, back in 2016, Barack Obama presented the Precision Medicine Initiative with a funding of $250 million. Up to today, the design and development of new molecules and treatment has been done thinking of an average patient. This generalistic point of view has made treatments to be very effective for some patients, but not at all for others. The precision medicine, on the other hand, will take, individual, will take into account individual characteristics, merging environmental, genetic, and lifestyle factors. It is thanks to this precision medicine that they will, it would allow uh, clinicians to know at individual level the physiopathology of diseases in order to know which of the patients are going to be responsive to all the treatments. However, besides this kind of initiatives in the US or even in Spain, in Europe, which uh, a month, a few weeks ago, uh, the EMMA published an article about the necessity uh, about, of having a consistent database base around Europe uh, in order to uh, get to the precision medicine, the reality is that the doctors have to be centered in writing the electronic medical record when they're in front of the patient instead of having a global and overall insight of their patients. However, the question is, what if we had all the information of the patients and all, not only those who participate in clinical trials? 
What if we, know, we knew which patients were going to be responsive to the treatments before administering to them? What if we, what, what if we had real-world real evidence or knowledge of all the clinical course of the patients and how those treatments behave? In other words, what if we could predict? Well, this is one of the main utilities of artificial intelligence and big data, which is going to rocket our current medicine to the precision medicine and deep medicine, which I have come here to talk to you about. In the past years, we have heard about political campaigns capable of conditioning the votes of the population and even predicting electoral results before they happen. We have heard that the police in Berlin has a predictive algorithm which allows, uh, to, which predicts um, where the next accidents are going to happen so that the police can anticipate to those events. We have heard that the German football national team had in 2014 a software which, is a, which was able to analyze the modus operandi or the tactics and the trainings of their opponent, opponents and then say that this was the main cause why they won the world championship in 2014. We have heard about predictive algorithms in the financial sector that allow economists to know which of the which uh, movements are going to be the most profitable. We have heard about cars that are driven automatically and platforms such as Amazon, Netflix or Spotify, which suggest content to the, to the users based on their own tastes. All these examples I have given you right now are real examples that are revolutionizing the world we live in based on artificial intelligence and big data. I would like you to remember in this presentation two numbers. The first of all is that unstructured data increases 70% every year. Right now, we generate around 20 setabytes per year. In 2025, which is just around the corner, we'll generate around 160 setabytes. The second number I would like you to remember is that data and health increases 48% every year. Back in uh, 2013, we generated 153 exabytes. However, by the end of this year, it is estimated that we're going to generate around 2,314 exabytes. As you can see, the growth is tremendously um, huge and exponential. Right now, we generate data in the healthcare sector from many sources. Electronic medical records, the so known uh, well wearables, pharmacy prescription, uh, genetic sequencing, medical images such as x-ray, CTs, MRs. However, we have come to a very contradictory uh, situation. And this is that we generate massive er amounts of data, but we have completely exceeded the human capability to analyze them. This is why we desperately need mathematical algorithms in order to analyze them. And the only way to get here is by merging and fusing the artificial intelligence and the human intelligence. There are many types of definition of artificial intelligence. However, all of them have one thing in common, and it's to teach to a machine to understand or act similarly to human beings. Artificial intelligence is a very general term which can be divided into different subclasses, such as vo voice processing, machine vision, robotics, machine learning, deep learning, and natural language processes within others. However, the ones that are considered to be really changing the healthcare sector are machine learning, deep learning, and natural language processing. 
Artificial intelligence and big data has arrived to the healthcare sector in multiple ways. First way, uh, it has gained a lot of importance in the pharmaceutical industry in order to design and develop different molecules and in order to predict adverse effects and toxicity. It has gained a lot of importance in the monitoring of patient healthcare, and this is probably the most known applicability. Thanks to the wearables, the patient has self-control and self-consciousness of his own state of health, which is crucial, especially for chronic diseases. Nowadays, the, the patient ha can have control on his blood pressure, blood and glucose, heart rate. Nowadays and currently, there's Castilla-La Mancha. Castilla-La Mancha, um, its um, population uh, is uh, two million uh, people. And uh, Savannah uh, has been introduced uh, in Castilla-La Mancha, being the first public healthcare system uh, using uh, this tool. Uh, Savannah has been indexed until now to 200,000 millions of clinical reports uh, from uh, consultation, hospitalization, emergency, and pharmacy. Uh, however, it doesn't have the report of, all, every, uh, of every department. Uh, for example, uh, pathological, anatomic, uh, laboratory, special tests, or radiology uh, reports uh, are still uh, remaining. But if the, the information of these specialties are collected uh, in, the, uh, in the consultation, hospitalization, emergency or pharmacy reports, the information will be indexed too. Currently, uh, Savannah has a restricted access uh, because it is still necessary to improve the performance uh, before providing a universal access. At the moment, there are people in the, from the, each of the three levels, primary care, hospital care, and management, uh, using uh, this tool by region. Uh, today, we are here in Odense, but uh, yesterday, I was in Torre del Burgo in my consultation, and uh, every day, I work here with my experience and uh, with the reference that some books and some articles take me. But for me, Savannah is like a window that uh, allows me to get away and have another point of view, and also see what is happening in other consultation and hospital of Castilla-La Mancha. Thanks to Savannah, I can transform the evidence-based medicine into data-based medicine, allowing me to get closer to the reality. Now, in order to explain the uses of Savannah Manager in primary care, I'm going to show you some samples. The first one is about rare disease. Uh, one day, Ricardo, one of the patients of my consultations, came and showed me a clinical report from a private clinic and told me, I have a new diagnosis, it is benigmastocytosis. And I say, okay, but in fact, I have never seen this type of disease outside the books. So um, I uh, searched uh, in my area the profile of the patient with this type of disease. And for that, I used Savannah Manager. And I uh, searched benign mastocytosis. And uh, in Castilla-La Mancha, uh, there are uh, 900, uh, more than 900 people with this disease. Uh, you can see in the graphic, uh, there are a um, bimodal distribution one peak in the childhood, and the other around the 15 years old. Vale. It's okay? Okay. It is a bit simple. Mm. It is a bit simple, but to know numbers, uh, we search again and now apply a new filter. 
10 years old or younger. And this was the result. More than 300 uh, patients under 10 years and more than 500 patients over 10 years. Also, uh, Savannah allows me the things and symptoms more frequent in this type of patient. And these are the results. Uh, fatigue, fever, and nausea are the more uh, common symptoms in this type of people. And also, we um, search the anaphylaxis uh, episodes in this uh, type of people. So Savannah allows me to know the prevalence, the distribution, and the symptoms of rare, of rare disease in my uh, health area. The second example is about pharmacological alerts. Uh, for example, uh, the CANVAS study uh, showed the benefits of canaglifosin in the prevention of renal and cardiovascular uh, disease in the patient with diabetes. But CANVAS studies show uh, a higher risk of amputation with using canaglifosin in this type of patient. Exactly 1,12 uh, amputations in, uh, per uh, 1,000 patients. So we know to check uh, what happened with canaglifosin in our uh, area. And uh, so we searched at first how many patients with diabetes uh, there are in Castilla-La Mancha, then how many of these uh, patients use canaglifosin, and as finally, how many of these patients have an amputation. And Well, the total number of uh, the patients with the three conditions are in Castilla-La Mancha, 29. And um, the conclusion was in Castilla-La Mancha, there are less than half of amputation that, that, study, that the, the CANVAS study described. So it is the second use of Savanna. It, uh, uh, it allows me to know what happened with the type of drug in my healthcare area. And the last uh, uh, example is about clinical variability. Uh, I work in a New York uh, urgent uh, care queue, and I release that a significant number of patients with COPD diagnosis had an spirometry, and how it could be possible. So uh, we search the relation between COPD patients and test lungs, and lung test, sorry. Um, and this is the result. Less than 50% of these patients had an spirometry. More than Okay. More than 80% have a, had a radiography, uh, more than 20% have a CT, and uh, more than 60% have uh, a gasometry. With these results, we release that we are doing something wrong. If the 50% if, uh, the of COPD patients don't have an spirometry. So the third use of Savannah is that Savannah uh, allows me to improve our patient care and also the research management. And now we are going to, to uh, see an example how to use Savannah. Uh, okay, uh, at first we must to go to the, um, to the main website of Savannah through Google, and we have to put here your, our username and not power, password, and okay, we are logging in, and this this is the interface of Savannah. Here we have the total number of patients, the age average, and the uh, distribution by gender. If we click here, we have applied some filters. Uh, we have the gender, men's and women, the uh, age range, and we have to choose the uh, dates of uh, the document. 
also we have to choose the uh, specialties, for example, rheumatology, cardiology, pneumology. We have to choose the filter that we want, and then we have to click in apply filters. Now we are going to search a simple, uh, uh, a simple example. For example, the relation between splenectomy and sepsis. So we put splenectomy, and now Savannah show me some synonyms of this, uh, of this word. So we have to, to choose the most correct according to our search. And okay, it is thinking. Okay, and now we have here the number of patients with an splenectomy in Castilla-La Mancha the age average, and the distribution by gender. Now, to search the second condition, we repeat the same search. We put here sepsis, and then we choose the most correct synonym. And we repeat all steps. So now we have the patient distribution, distribution with the two conditions, splenectomy and sepsis in Castilla-La Mancha. Under, we have the hospital index, for example, the hospitalization days, and uh, the mortality. And under that, we have the patient characteristics. For example, the most common diagnosis, risk cardiovascular fac uh, factors, treatment, things and symptoms, tests, and also, if we click uh, here, uh, we uh, can generate a database with, uh, with all the documents that Savannah read. And as a support for this tool, we have direct communication with the technical team that have created it. So what's that? Uh, what, what the next? What is the future of all of this? OK, in the future, I hope that uh, tools like Savannah are used to improve our daily work and by that improve our patients' lives. The big data is the, the key to buy a new kind of medicine, a medicine, a personalized medicine, focus on caring is on individu individual and how to optimize uh, the wellness, predictive medicine, identify what's likely to happen in the future, preventive medicine, recognize the early things and this, of disease when it's more reversible, and finally, a more participatory medicines. It means the empowerment of the patient. All of this probably allows us to create a new era for the more decade lines. And now we are going to see a promotional video about Savannah. Yeah. I forget to say it. Mm, maybe? No? sanidad tiene que girar en torno al paciente y con el paciente. Necesitamos que las nuevas tecnologías y las herramientas innovadoras permitan hacerlo con seguridad. 
el Big Data nos va a permitir analizar muchos más datos de una manera muy rápida. Esto va a repercutir en que podamos aprovechar toda esta información que no estamos aprovechando para, por ejemplo, hacer tratamientos más personalizados, para diagnosticar antes al paciente e incluso para intentar prever situaciones de riesgo que pueda tener el paciente. La inteligencia artificial y el Big Data, el análisis masivo de datos, creo que ha llegado a la salud para quedarse. Y de hecho estoy segura de que va a cambiar nuestra clínica diaria, la actividad del clínico a diario, porque va a ser una herramienta accesible. Va a cambiar también la gestión sanitaria, porque los datos que tienen los gestores gracias a ella van a ser también de mucho más rápido acceso e incluso de mucho más valor que las herramientas que tenemos hasta ahora. Y finalmente creo que también va a cambiar la investigación clínica. No va a entrar en competencia de lo que es los ensayos clínicos, sino que va a ayudar a mejorar la información de la investigación clínica gracias a lo que es el análisis de la población global y del Real World Evidence. Sistemas de Big Data como Sabana nos permite conocer qué está ocurriendo en la vida real, en las consultas, en mi caso, de todo el Servicio de Salud de Castilla-La Mancha. De esa manera puedo conocer cómo los compañeros están consiguiendo resultados y de esa manera desarrollar estrategias que sirven para, para ellos y también para mi consulta diaria. Realmente Sabana ha cambiado nuestra práctica clínica, la de nuestro equipo, porque nos ha permitido analizar los datos incluidos en nuestra historia clínica electrónica de una forma que hasta ahora era imposible, de tal modo que ahora mismo somos capaces de traducir esos datos en conocimiento. Ahora con Sabana, las ideas que tengo las puedo llevar a la práctica de forma mucho más concreta. Antes un trabajo podía llevar meses y ahora cuando la metodología encaja en la búsqueda de sabana, el resultado se puede conseguir en días. Se ha aumentado mi producción, también la calidad y también el número de pacientes con los que estoy trabajando, porque han pasado de centenares a miles. Para los profesionales del hospital ha sido un antes y un después la aplicación de Sabana. Creo que Sabana en el paciente con cáncer nos puede ofrecer una herramienta que correlacione la información molecular que no somos capaces todavía de identificar o de saber exactamente a la profundidad de la trascendencia que tiene, es unido con los datos clínicos, creo que nos puede generar una información muy valiosa. Creo que es una herramienta para el paciente con cáncer absolutamente, o para la prevención del, del paciente con cáncer absolutamente imprescindible nos permite a golpe de clic en el ordenador poder obtener la información de todo lo que hemos estado realizando, lo cual nos ayuda a mejorar nuestros procesos diagnósticos, a tener seguridad de que aplicamos las guías clínicas correctamente, nos ayuda a disminuir la variabilidad de los profesionales y por tanto, sobre todo, y lo más importante, da seguridad a los profesionales en la atención al paciente. Al final, la investigación y el uso de Sabana como herramienta de investigación, al final la repercusión debe ser la mejora de la atención de los pacientes, que al final todos trabajamos para eso. Yo soy médico de familia y yo quiero que mis pacientes estén mejor atendidos. Y Sabana me proporciona herramientas y conocimientos que me ayudan a lograr ese objetivo. Thank you very much to Paula. Oh, thank you very much to Teresa. Is there somebody who has any question? Hello. 
uh, I want to ask if, it's, if it is possible for, for you from Castilla-La Mancha to widen the spectrum of your search and access uh, all the data that Savannah has recorded, for example, from Germany? No, no, it's possible. It's, yet. Only for, it's uh, not possible yet. Okay. It's only for uh, the region, for Castilla-La Mancha. Okay, thank you. This is because of privacy policies. So uh, Castilla-La Mancha has it through other regions, but in the rest of the hospitals, on, you're only allowed to access the information of your own hospital. Unless you participate in the real world evidence studies where the database is completely anonym, anonymized and therefore you can we generate an aggregated but anonymized database. So you don't know which patient, you can't identify the patient and you can't identify the hospital. Sí, sí, claro. Ya, mi inglés ya se queda cortísimo. Eh, ¿Tú crees que esto podría ser en el futuro si el país, nuestro país en general, eh, adquiriera un mismo sistema? ¿Podríamos tener la información en cualquier punto concreto, en un momento concreto de, de nuestro país? En, eh, o sea, por que... ejemplo, yo que vivo en Guadalajara, eh, voy a Barcelona y mediante un sistema de este tipo en Barcelona podrían tener acceso a mis datos sanitarios o a mi historia clínica o cómo. O sea, eh, según la... Yes, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Yes, sorry. exactly. The question was if what what does the, the, what the speaker think about getting Savannah not only in this region that they have the now, but what about if it can grow to all around the country? So following GDPR, GDPRs, uh, right now I don't think it's possible because uh, the privacy of the patient is something in Europe really strict. For example, in the US, it's much less strict, but uh, um, I don't think the sharing of patient information across hospitals is going to be possible. Or so just, well, maybe if it's anonymized and you can never re-identify the patient, that could be an option. But if there's a way to re-identify, I don't think um, right now it's going to be possible. <laughs> Thank you so much for a very, very interesting presentation. Uh, and, and, um, and, and I think from a, from a Danish perspective, where we actually are doing, we are sharing data, and maybe I would just like to mention that across platforms and across hospitals, um, but always with the granting of the patient. So yeah, look at it. To grant everyone's access. Yeah. Uh, oh. Would that be something you might be able to enter at some point where you say, okay, you know, I say no, I don't want to be included? Uh, that they might be able to interact. So the way we work is that we create an aggregated and synthetic database. So that means um, that uh, we, so that's why we don't need information consent so far. Okay, and plus we introduce some kind of noise so that at a certain percent, so we create a statistical model of patients. It's not real patient, like it is at the end of the patient. It's a statistical model of my patient. So there's always going to be a percentage, a little percentage of error right now. So uh, a patient can say they don't want to participate. Um, but if that patient is already included in a study, for example, because of it's anonymized, they can't be extracted from that, uh, from that um, that's the uh, study. But if the pay, if before that database is extracted and before the information get, getting out of the hospital, of course the patient can say that they don't want to participate. Mm. And all the, its clinical course will be deleted from the 
won't even get to Savannah. And if it gets, we can delete it. And the last question is, when do you think that we in Denmark as a primary care can use your system, having a patient come into our clinic, then they read our data? Yeah. And then they say, well, now you actually have a person with high risk of leukemia or something I would not see as a practitioner. When do you think that's going to happen? In Denmark? Well, let, let's say in start, let's start in Europe in, oh, in your well, place first and then when? In other countries. No, in, your, in your area. So, um, uh, oh, you mean, so right now, um, so Savannah is expanding. So our model of lecture is not based on a language. I mean, it's based on a language, but it's not exclusive for a certain language. So uh, it was developed to be translated into multiple languages. So as long as you want to participate in the ecosystem, that's a yeah, fine and perfect for us. Um, so it's just the, uh, it can happen as long as there's one clinician that wants to participate in, the, in any of the studies. There's no, I mean, obviously there's the legal part that would have to be taken into account, the, uh, the ethical committee and all those legal parts, but there's no kind of barrier. If you're interested, you contact me or anyone in my <laughs> <laughs> company and <laughs> we can come and visit you. <laughs>